Hey, everybody. Welcome to Take Off with John Clark. Appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please rate and review it wherever you listen to your podcast and subscribe for free. This is the New World Podcast, right? It sure is. Welcome in our special guest, Philly's president of baseball operations, Dave Dombrowski. And we appreciate the time because I know this is a really busy time for you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It is a busy time, but appreciate uh, you having me on. So you've only been here seven months, right? And you came in, you're evaluating everything. You're trying to know what you have. Do you know what you have with this baseball team this year yet, or are you still evaluating and trying to figure it out? Well, I think you're always evaluating. That never stops, no matter how long you're with a, a team. But, and I still think we're evaluating because sometimes players perform differently um, under pennant type of pressure. Uh, when it gets dialed up, I mean, we have a shot. You know, so you're always evaluating that. But I do have a pulse much better, of course, now of what we have compared to when I first came in. Because when you first came in, when I first came in here, you're in a position where you're dependent upon other people's opinions. Some very good opinions, but you also like to form your own. And so having a chance to watch the club play for an extended period and get a pulse of what's taking place. What do you think is the strength of this team and what do you think is the weakness? Or there might be several strengths and weaknesses. Well, I mean, I think the strength of our club um, probably falls in a couple places. One is our, our three top starting pitchers uh, are really good. Now, Wheeler's been outstanding this year. He's been another level. And I think Nolan and Eflin have been good. Um, maybe not as good as they've been in the past sometimes, but really that's a strength of the team. When you start with those three guys at the top of your rotation, that's a pretty good place to start. Uh, I think our everyday lineup, when it's together, has the ability to score runs. Um, we haven't been together very much at all, though, this year. But when we have, it was just over a short time period, we, we score runs. Uh, when you talk about you know, our weaknesses, our defense is not our strength. We hope that we outscore that part, our defense, with the lineup that we put out there. Actually, the back end of the bullpen, of course, has struggled at times. It's been a little bit better recently, but it's a situation where I think we have the ability to get it together. Some of the guys have started to throw better. So, for example, a, a pre premium piece for us out there, a guy like Ranger Suarez, who wasn't with us earlier in the year, um, he's an important part. Archie Bradley's all of a sudden starting to throw all the ball much better. So I, I think that's an area that, for us, has struggled at times, but it's getting a little bit better. Last year, of course, Philadelphia and everybody went through maybe one of the worst bullpens in baseball history. And you made moves, good moves, um, and then you have the most blown saves in baseball. I don't know if you agree with that stat. That's what they put out there because it's at any point when the bullpen is in there. But uh, how much of a challenge has it been to recreate the bullpen and get a quality bullpen? Well, I mean, I, first of all, I think we're, when talking to people, we're much better this year with the ability out there than we were last year. Um, the results, though, speak for itself in the sense that we really went through a tough time. And it's, it's like a lot of things. When you're going through a tough time period, it's hard to get out no matter what happened out there. It was almost impossible to look that we would blow a save day after day there for a while. But I think the ability has started to step up a little bit more like Suarez with Bradley, with um, Alvarado, um, even Neris, now that he's out of the closer's role, has been pitching better. Kinsler's throwing the ball better. Brogdon's throwing the ball better. So, but it's, I mean, it's a situation that you looked upgrade. We upgraded it. It still hasn't performed as high a level as we had hoped, and it's an area that you're always looking to upgrade as you're in a pennant race. When you came here, you said you thought this team could contend, but you said we're not one player away from championship contender. Has the team done what you thought, or have they underachieved from, from what you thought? Well, I wouldn't say we've underachieved. Um, we're sitting here at 500. I think we're better than a 500 team, personally. Um, I think we've played much better here recently over the last 15, 20 games. So we're, we've been playing better. I think we're in a position, we are contending, which is we're doing this interview, we're two and a half games out of first place. We have a chance to win. We legitimately have a chance to win. We have to do the little things right. We have to advance runners, get runners in from third base. We have to be in a position, where, and we have cut down our strikeouts a great deal. We have to make the routine plays from a defensive perspective. Um, those are all things that we can do. The, the one place is where it's really been, that's why I say well, I don't think we've underperformed in this sense. When we've had our everyday lineup in there, we've scored runs. But we just haven't been together very much. But when we're together, we have had the ability to put some runs up on the board. and. I think we're in a position that when we can put them all together and if we can keep them on the field together, 
that we have a chance to be in a position where we score runs, hopefully get on a little bit of a streak and try to win the division. Well, I'm going to throw a fastball right over the plate. If the trade deadline is tomorrow, are you a buyer or a seller? Well, I mean, I, when they say we're not selling, I mean, we're not, we're not in a position where we're looking to move players off our team. Now, if you're in a position and, and anything can happen in 10 days or two weeks, I mean, if all of a sudden, and I, I don't like to take this scenario, I don't think in the next, if you lose 10 games in a row, well, that might be one thing that's a little bit different. Or if you win 10 games in a row, it's a little bit different. But we're in a position where we're in this, and we're going to try to make our club better here um, over the next time period. How do you weigh that, yes, you are contending a couple games out of the division, but if you're in any other division, you'd be 10, 11 games back. You're basically a 500 team right now. How do you weigh that when deciding how much to go for it? Well, it's a great question, and, and I think um, you, you juggle a lot of different things into that. First of all, and I've always been of this and been in the postseason many times with clubs, once you make it, anything can happen. And if you're in a position, for example, with our club, in any short series, if you go in there with Wheeler, Nola, Eflin, all throwing well, and they all have the capabilities to do that, you can beat anybody. It doesn't matter how good or bad a team you are. You can, can beat anybody. So if you make the postseason, it's extremely important. And I've been on clubs that we've had a much better record than the club that beat us in the postseason. And so first thing is you try to get there. Secondly, I think you have to be reasonable. Um, you want to get there, but you don't also, and I'll just use an example, our number one draft choice from last year. You can't trade your number one draft choice from this year, Mick Abel. Well, we're not looking to trade him where we are at this point and probably never looking to trade him. He's got that type of a value and ability that he can be a really a number one type starter, starting pitcher down the road. So I think you weigh what are people asking for in return. Um, where are you at that particular moment? Things change a lot. I mean, we are five games under 500 two weeks ago. Now we're back to 500 and um, climbing a little bit, hopefully. So you weigh all those things and you make the decision at that particular time. What do you think is your biggest need now to get the team over the hump to win the division? Well, without tipping my hands too much in that point, because people I'm look at these the corners say, yeah, here. people that. <laughs> but I mean, I, I think we're in a position that we can get better in a few places by all means. Um, we don't have a perfect ball club. There is no perfect club, but we can get better in a, in a couple spots. Um, I think I'll kind of leave that at that that's position that, hey, we, we have areas that we can address and improve, and we'll just wait to see. Because some of it is, a, is also availability of players. Now, you could just pick, um, uh, let's just say, um, which we don't need, as you can say, a number one starting pitcher. We don't need that. We have Wheeler. But then you're in a position to say, well, who's available that's a number one starting pitcher? Well, maybe there's nobody that particular year, or the price of that acquisition would be so high that you would not even think of doing it. So then you kind of have your alternatives on what you're trying to do. So I think you weigh all of that all the time in what you're doing, and that's my job and the baseball department's job to be on top of those things, to know what clubs are looking to do, what players we have that are of interest to them, who may be able to help us, salary levels, all those type of things. But I can say here one thing that's no question from a Philadelphia Phillies perspective when you talk about an ownership with John Middleton and the Buck family. They want to win. They, they want to do anything they can to possibly win. Now they want to do it in the perspective of being realistic too. But um, we're going to try to do what we can. If we have a chance to win, we're going to try to do what we can to, to accomplish that. Yeah, and obviously it's been 10 years since his team was in the playoffs. <laughs> And even though they're a 500 team, you said, hey, once you get in the playoffs, you have a chance. But you come in here probably trying to rebuild a farm system, right? So how do you weigh, is this team really good enough to make it to the National League Championship Series or World Series versus maybe a chance to get the farm system going again? Well, I mean, again, when, when people talk about that, um, and I've been in a position, I know throughout my career, everybody says, well, the East trade a lot of guys in the farm system. We are looking to rebuild the farm system, and we're, we're taking some strides. I think we had a great draft last week. Brian Barber is in charge of our scouting department, amateur scouting. I think they had a great, a great draft. They had a, a smaller draft, but some players that we liked from last year. And we have some others, of course, in the organization, too. So you're always looking to try to accomplish that because the best organizations have great scouting and player development systems. But I think it also depends upon you need to be realistic on 
what are the top levels that those players are going to achieve? Are you talking about a guy who's a number one or number two starting pitcher? Well, that's a lot different than a, a number five starting pitcher. You can usually go find a number five starting pitcher. Is the guy going to be an everyday positional player, or is he going to be an extra player for you on the bench that you can go acquire in a much easier fashion? So what I've tried to do is when you make trades, you're trying to not trade the upper echelon type guys, you're trying to trade guys that, well, maybe they'll play in the big leagues. You realize that that's the price of acquisition of a good player, but you try to make sure that, first and foremost, your own evaluation process of your organization is accurate. And sometimes you're wrong because, I mean, players are not um, just machines. Sometimes they get better, sometimes they get worse. But you hope that that's something that you do very well. So we combine trying to get better in the farm system with trying to win, and that's what we'll continue to do. Having blown the most leads with the bullpen in baseball, uh, that can be really tough on a team. And you could also say, hey, we were good enough to lead in all those games but lost them. Uh, do you think this team does need a closer? Well, right now, um, and we're talking at a time in which we lost the lead yesterday, but Ranger Suarez has been outstanding for us. I mean, if you acquired somebody and you said they were putting up the numbers that Ranger Suarez have put up so far this year, you'd be ecstatic. So um, I think that we can close internally, and there are very few closers that would be out there that would be available that would be a tremendous upgrade over what we had. I think our bullpen is starting again to settle in a little bit more with, with Suarez out there, Bradley stepping up, Neris in a different position, Alvarado hopefully throwing more strikes, but some of those other guys have helped us a great deal. Even a guy like Bailey Falter, who doesn't get much attention, has really done a good job for us. So we're in a position that can we get better? For sure. Are we in a position you say, oh, we can't win with who we have out there? I, I don't know that that's the case. You talk to teams all the time. Some people say the Phillies don't have any prospects that other teams would want. Is that the case right now, or could you make a deal with prospects that you have? No, we could make a deal with prospects. I mean, I, I know that that ends up being... You know, people say that, oh, they don't have any prospects. I've been in that position before, and I've also been in where they have the most prospects. So, um, But, no, we could make deals if we needed to. There's no question about that. Now, do we want to make those deals? Do we want to give up those particular players? But we have a lot of players that are, are highly regarded by other organizations. So that would not be the, the holdup in that case. A lot of Phillies fans see Dave Dombrowski, and you've been aggressive when you know your team has a chance to win. Mm -hmm. Should they get excited like there could be a big move, or do you think it would be more of a lower-tier move, like you said, or middle-tier move? Well, that is to be determined, really. And I, when I say that, I'm not being evasive in the answers. I mean, I think it's a situation here. We came out of the break, want to watch, see how we play. Um, we split the first two games so far. We've got two games today and then go to New York, and then we have some big series with Atlanta and Washington coming up. And at this time of year, things switch a lot. But I think it's very dependent upon, again, some clubs are the same way as we are. I mean, we're not going to be in a position where we are selling, per se, or moving a lot of players unless something catastrophic happens. So we're in a situation where you're looking to evaluate and what do you particularly need. You have injury factors that come into play with it. Other organizations are the same way. So you're in a position to say, well, some of them, all of a sudden they lose three in a row and somebody may be available that you weren't anticipating being available. So right now I think you keep a pulse of what's going on and we'll be in a position where we'll just react accordingly. How difficult is it in baseball, especially during this time, pretty much every team looking for good relievers? Well, yeah, I, yes, and, and the reason behind that usually is pretty simple. I mean, when you think about it, okay, you have a, a club of 25 players. <clears throat> Your pitching staff, most of them are 13 or 14. So you have five starting pitchers. So you have eight or nine bullpen guys. So that's a third of your roster, basically. So you're always in a position you can upgrade somewhat over there. Now, some people may need closers. Some may need a left-handed reliever. Some may need a guy who can be the setup guy. But I don't think there's probably a place in baseball where you ask them, could you upgrade your bullpen? And everybody will say, oh, yeah, I can upgrade my bullpen. Yeah. It just depends. Um, what particular role and how much they want to do in that regard. You're right behind the Mets, as you said. Does it influence you if the Mets go out and make a big move or the Nationals or Braves or teams like that that are right there with you? Not really, um, because I assume that they're going to try to do everything they can to possibly win. Now, they're dealing with the same factors as we are as far as injury factors are concerned, too, um, in every other club in baseball, so you're looking at that. Uh, 
you're also looking at streaks. Washington, for example, uh, just a couple of weeks ago when Schwarber was hot, they all of a sudden were 500, I think, and maybe a game or so above. He got hurt. They hit the West Coast, and they've lost, they lost six, seven games in a row, and they were playing a tougher schedule, and then they got beat. So all of a sudden, there's six, seven games below 500. So it can change that quickly with the swing of one. I mean, Schwarber was the hottest hitter in baseball at that particular time. So not really. I think in their situations, you need to look at your own club. And the way I look at it is, okay, look at our club right now. Do we have a chance to win? Yes. What will make us win? X, Y, Z. Those clubs are going to do their own thing no matter what. They're going to try to do what they can as far as them winning. And I should just think that they're going to do everything they can to possibly win. So we should do the same. You know, this, this whole pandemic has been very difficult for everybody. Uh, and you had a situation where you're missing some guys right now because of the whole vaccinate or not vaccinate thing. What is your stance on that? Because, you know, Aaron Nola says it's a personal choice. Mm -hmm. And this is such a difficult thing because it does affect the team if, if he's sure. not able to be out there. What's your stance on that? And have you talked to the guys and encouraged them in, in getting vaccinated? Well, I think, uh, first of all, yes, we've encouraged the players to be vaccinated. We've done that from the beginning of the season, really through spring training until the beginning of the season, and have continued to do so. We've educated them, given them material, had presentations made to them. But I also do think it's a personal decision. Um, do I wish all players were vaccinated? Yes, I'm vaccinated. I think it's good my family's vaccinated. But I can't prevent what other people think in that regard. So I think you just have to react accordingly. Uh, it would make our lives a lot easier if everybody was vaccinated, but I don't think that that's something you can force upon somebody. I think it's an individual choice, and uh, we just have, a, unfortunately, in some cases, have a lot of players that choose to not be vaccinated for all the particular reasons. I have talked to some of them about it. I would never force them to do it, but I've tried to get their reasonings, and they have their reasonings, and if I agree with them or, or don't, it really doesn't make a difference. It's their particular uh, decision. It's interesting because there's some things, decisions that can affect a locker room. And if a bunch of guys have gotten the vaccine and they're vaccinated and then some don't and it affects the competitive uh, level of the team, you know, because some guys are out. Have you checked in on the clubhouse? You know, is there any issues with that? Well, there doesn't seem to be. Um, I can't tell you that somebody doesn't say internally, like, I wish that guy got vaccinated. But um, our clubhouse is a pretty close clubhouse. Our players are close together. Um, when we talked about the pluses of a club, one of the things that our club definitely does, we don't give up, we compete, we're very much into coming back in that regard. We don't give in, I think we're a tough clubhouse. And I don't see that there's any of those issues whatsoever. Again, um, I think all of us realize when you miss a player, and you miss, now Nola missed a start, fortunately we won that game. Bowman's been out 10 days. Earlier in the year we lost Alvarado for a couple games when he was throwing the ball real well for a week. I think we would have won a couple games maybe that week so that comes into play but so I'm sure people look at that but I don't feel any sense of um, animosity there I think they respect the individuals I, I would compare it in a, in a lot of ways um, to political nature when people are involved in politics I mean people have some real contrasting views in politics and especially when you start talking about a, a major league clubhouse where people come from all over the world so there's all different environments that people have grown up. And I think because of that process that we've been in throughout our careers and when players are in their careers, they realize there's such a differences of opinions and difference of feelings and how people, that they've grown up with that. So I think they have the ability to respect the other individual's opinions. And again, not that they necessarily agree with them, but they realize that that's part of being in a major league clubhouse with all different nationalities, personalities involved. And right now, you're looking at possibly adding a player in a trade, possibly. Uh, would it affect your decision at all, knowing whether somebody is vaccinated or not, and, and how that could affect their availability down the road for the second half? No, not really, I don't think. I think you're in a situation where um, you, you're going to make the acquisition that you think is the right acquisition for yourself at that time. Now, does it cross my mind? Um, you, you acquire somebody and then all of a sudden they and they're not vaccinated but I, I not right now there's been people that have been vaccinated that are still testing positive so um, it, it's just one of those things that you have to deal with and I, I mean it's very similar I've been in a spot where you make acquisitions at the trading deadline they work out great for you I've been at sometimes that they don't work out great for you I've had a couple times I've made trades where unfortunately right after you make them the player gets hurt 
So you have to deal with those things, and that's why I want to say it's an inexact situation. It's not a science. There's a lot of human involvement in those type of things. And if somebody would say, say you make the acquisition, and a week later the pitcher comes up with a sore arm, and then if somebody says, well, would you have made that trade 10 days ago? Well, if I'd known he was going to have a sore arm, no, I wouldn't have <laughs> made that trade. Yeah. But there's some, some things you can't control, and that's why I think you have to be very um, aware of that. And once you're in the game for a long time, there's just things that happen that are beyond your control. Cole Hamels is out there. Uh, yes, he I believe is. you guys watched his workout on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, how did he look, and is he a guy that you would consider to bring back here to Philly? Well, Cole threw the ball well the other day. Um, there were a lot of clubs out there watching him. We, we were doing our due diligence at this time, and yes, I mean, he's a guy that we're interested in. I don't know where that's going to take us at this particular time. The one thing in Cole's case, and he's the first to admit it, he's not, if you assign him, he's not ready to pitch now. He has to go to, through his own spring training. So you're talking about somebody that's 30 to 40 days down the road helping you. So you have to factor that into play, too. But, well, we're interested enough to see him, and uh, he's a guy that we'll continue to watch. I know a lot of traditional baseball people say, I'm old school. And then there's like this analytics versus old school. Um, I remember John Middleton saying, I brought analytics to the Phillies. I'm the one driving the bus. How do you balance old school scouting eye test against analytics and numbers? Well, again, another great question, and I think probably in an organization in today's world is probably uh, one of the biggest challenges for successful for organizations, and the ones that do that well are the successful organizations, because I think that, first of all, you live with tradition, and some traditions are great, and other traditions get old-fashioned. Um, and just because they're a tradition doesn't mean that they're right. But there's a lot of good things that you've learned. And I'll just use an example. Let's say for me, I like a two-strike approach for a hitter. I don't like him to just go up there and think a strikeout's okay. Now, sometimes you're in a spot you know the guy's going to try to hit a home run. It's 2-2. Two to two, You're trying to win a game. There's two out. The guy's a home run hitter in the ninth inning, and you're, and you're going for it. But all in all, that's a tradition, one example that I like. Um, so I want to keep that tradition. And yet, there's, you, I don't think you can ever be close-minded to things that make you better. And a lot of the contemporary information that we receive can make us better. And so we incorporate that. And to me, the best way to do it is to blend both of them together and have people that are traditionalists and people that are contemporary, but they respect one another's decisions and they can work together that you can make the best decision you possibly can. And it's possible to do that. It is very much so. Uh, for example, I mean, I've never been against all of the progressive stuff. I think it's very important. I've my, I mean, got a mathematic background and also, and, and always have tried to do that. Um, but I'll say, for example, for us, Sam Fuld, our general manager, well, he's really good at that. He, he's He's been that part. Now, I've got more tradition than Sam has. Now, he's played more than me, but I have more tradition. I've been in the game a lot longer. But I think blending the combination of what we bring to it and having that approach followed throughout our organization, um, because everybody needs to be on the same page. So you need to be in a position where, hey, okay, even if you're a traditionalist, if somebody points something out that makes you better, and you just say, well, I don't like that because that's it. Well, you, you need to be open-minded to things. So the best organizations look to blend those, and that's something I think we're doing and we will continue to do and emphasize here over the next time period. A couple final questions if you have the time. Sure. Uh, let's check in on a couple players. Adam Hazley, how's he doing? Is there any plan for him to come up to the club again at any point this year? Well, Adam's doing much better. Uh, he's doing well. He's actually now in our Gulf Coast League. He actually, when he got back, pulled a, a muscle in his leg, so he's been down in the Gulf Coast League rehab and he's playing every day so he's pretty close to then getting to the point of being able to move out of there and he'll at that point would rejoin our triple-a team at this time how about scott kingery uh some people felt that maybe analytics played a role in the change of his swing or maybe having an uppercut swing or trying to hit home runs um is that the case and how's he doing well i i wasn't here first exactly. of all when when all that happened so i can only give you by hearsay and that he did make some adjustments and working with an individual to change his swing path, uh, more of an uppercut type swing rather than a more level line drive type of swing. Got himself into some bad habits, striking out a bit, a bit more. 
Um, we tried to change that this year, and he started making some adjustments again in spring training and going down to AAA. Uh, he was working on those adjustments, and then unfortunately for Scott, I mean, he's had a lot of little injuries, but he ended up just recently having a shoulder surgery um, for him, and that's keeping him out the rest of the season. So he had a, um, something fixed, some labral stuff that he'll be ready to go for next year, but he's in a position where he'll be out the rest of the season. How about Alec Bohm? Um, obviously, you saw the promise that he has in the talent. Um, is this part of what a player can go through sometimes? Yes, it is. I think Alec Bohm is a perfect example of a very talented individual, had a good rookie year that the league adjusts to you, and then you need to make adjustments back, and it's that give and take. But he's very talented. Uh, he can hit. I can, he's going to hit with power. He hasn't had many home runs this year, but you see that he has power. He is continuing to work on his defense. But it's, it's tough to get over the hump as a, an established major league player. They attack your weaknesses all the time. And so you need to make those type of adjustments. And then a guy like Alec not only making adjustments, but he's never failed before. He's always been in a position that he's succeeded wherever he's played. So dealing with the failures on the daily basis where you're not sometimes too tough on yourself and yet work your way through it and battle through it, but don't get down. Um, I think he's going to be a very fine player, and he's going to be a real good player. And I've had many players in my career go through this type of thing, and I think he'll be fine. But he's gone through those struggles. It's a shame because now he got the COVID, as we talked about, and he was really playing much better. He was swinging the bat over the last six weeks at over a 300 clip. He's starting to drive the ball. Uh, he's been a little bit better defensively at third base. But, um, again, he faces the trial tribulations of uh, the everyday season at the big league level, and, and he'll be back soon. Always remember, Mike Schmidt hit under 200 his second year. There's a great example. So if we have another Mike Schmidt, we'd be very happy in that regard. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't mean to put that on him either, but and no, I'd be mean very to happy. Uh, how about Aaron Nola? We've seen times where he's just an absolute ace, one of the best pitchers in baseball. And then we've seen the last couple Septembers not pitch as well, and then he's gone through a rough stretch. What do you think happens to him? Uh, a guy can't be an ace all the time, but what do you think happens to him and, and try to get that consistency? Well, the September issues, which have been here beforehand, uh, my guess from just talking to people is that he gets tired. Uh, I mean, that he's in a position, he pitches a lot of innings. He works really hard during the year, and he's been in a position where that September catches up to him. We've been very careful, and I tip my cap to, to Joe Girardi and Caleb, our pitching coach, because... One thing, even though our guys have some innings, they've never pushed guys to come back on short rest. We give them extra rest all the time this year with the idea of, okay, a healthy pitching staff in September can be just as important as just who's available out there. So being healthy and being in a position where you can go out and perform is very important. So, And I think the other thing with him this year, his stuff's been good. We've seen some outstanding out, outings for him. I think what ends up happening is mechanically, he gets a little bit out with his delivery, and they work on it, and he gets it back into gear, and he's fine. He'll go out there, throw a great game, and then all of a sudden he'll have a mechanical adjustment. And he, there's a lot of moving parts in his delivery, and I think he's fallen into that a couple times this year. But, again, he's aware of it. I wouldn't shock me if he goes out there and pitches against the Yankees on Tuesday and shuts them down. Now, uh, how about Bryce Harper and JT Real Muto? Obviously, when Bryce Harper signed here, uh, John Middleton said, hey, we're going to be a winner, and we're going to go out. I'm going to give you everything I can from a financial standpoint. And then you re-sign JT Real Muto. How much influence do they have with you and everybody? You know, Bryce is very vocal, uh, and, and he says, we want to make sure we give Dave a reason to go make a deal. How much influence do they have as kind of the leaders of this organization uh, to push forward and, and go for it? Well, I mean, they're influential in that they're – are better players, right? I mean, they're our foundation players. They've signed for a long time. They're talented players. I mean, JT just started in the All-Star game, and Bryce um, had a little bit of a down first half, start off real well, but then start picking it up at the end. But these are two star major league players that have signed long-term contracts here. So they, they represent, you know, they're, you want their leadership in the clubhouse, you want their leadership on the field, you want their abilities to speak for itself that they're star players. Um, I want them to be, I mean, I, I have a nice relationship. I talk to them, and we're in a position where I gladly will listen to an ear that they have whatever they have to say. But I'm also in a position where, um, uh, just for example, if they said, um, one of them said, well, hey, I want you to go trade for this guy. Well, that doesn't, that's not the same thing. I mean, you have to make those decisions yourself. I always welcome them. I mean, I welcome everybody's opinion, and two, they're two foundation-type guys that got a pulse of the game and players and all that. 
Um, so you listen, but ultimately you're making those type of decisions. We were talking uh, before we did this interview about how young people are consuming news and information now and then the things they're interested in. And when you started out in baseball, I mean, I remember as a kid, I used to go to twine night doubleheaders at the vet. Six, seven hours of baseball, it's awesome. But obviously nowadays, we're kind of living in a TikTok world with the younger generation coming up, the tension span. What do you think baseball can do to improve length of games, uh, pace of play, and just having more action? Well, I think uh, that's a very in-depth question and a very long question, really, to answer. But I think one of the things you just said itself for the younger people, you need pace of play. I mean, you need to be in a position where the pace is quicker. Well, what can they do? Well, you're in a position where not as many seconds between pitches, not as many guy walking up to the batter's box, not letting guys step out of the batter's box. Those are all things that can take some time off of it. Um, I think that they, people like action. So you see the first thing, they, one step they've taken is the substance aspect of it from the pitcher's perspective, and offense has already improved in that. There's more, not as many strikeouts as there was before. They're testing a lot of things at the minor league level to see if anything can help at the big league level. And you talk about automatic strike, automated strike zones, you talk about bigger bases, you talk about no shifting or limited shifting. So those are all things I think that can be done to improve the game. Like for, for example, and now I just read the other day, I'm actually an advocate. I really like the extra inning rule as it exists right now. I like the idea of in the 10th inning being in a position where you've got action right off the bat. Now I understand postseason's a little bit different. So I think there are things that can be done in general with this. Of course, you need the cooperation of the players and the Players Association. But I think it's important for us because the secret to the game of baseball success for the long term ends up being that you want to be um, appealing to the younger generation. So you need to make a lot of adjustments that there's more action, quicker action. People are viewing the game in a different way. But you also have a lot of traditionalists. It's the same way as when you talk about putting together an organization. So you have a lot of traditionalists, older fans that come to the ballpark that want certain things that they just love to sit there and talk and be entertained and watch what's going on. So you need to have the combination of both of those when you make those decisions. And I think the people up in uh, the central offices in Major League Baseball, they're cognizant of that and they, they constantly weigh that. That's great. And hopefully uh, we can have a good uh Good action the second half of the season here with the Phillies. Sounds great to me. Yeah, and good luck. Uh, you're going to be busy over the next couple of weeks with the trade deadline coming. We appreciate the time here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate everybody listening. Subscribe to uh, Take Off with John Clark wherever you listen to your podcast. Thanks for listening.